My name is Matt Schwendek, as you've seen. I'm German-born. I'm a nomad since about 12 years. Um, I do one-on-one -on -one sessions, I do couple sessions, I do group sessions. I've done probably 20 of these online festivals and I don't know how many workshops and retreats and sessions I can't tell anymore. So I have been through uh, um, uh, the Tao school, through different Tantra school, uh, yoga practitioner, and um, I'm a TRE provider. I'm super excited about anything that has to do with um, trauma release. So I'm a um, um, TRE practitioner and facilitator. Um, I'm a cattle party facilitator. And in my first life, I was a car mechanic. Can you believe that? That was when I was a teenager, I started when I was 16. And then I started architecture. And then in my end, my, in end of my 20s, I had this tantric awakening. And something was hitting me that the way how I lived relationship and sexuality was pretty much conditioned through mainly pornography. And the goal-driven and goal-oriented uh, gratification sex that most people know. So sexuality has a beginning and sexuality has an end. And that's most of the time a climax. And that was my story. I was 27. I fell in love with a woman. We locked ourselves in a room. I um, was madly in love. We had sex for a week like crazy. I was coming all over the show 25 times in this uh, week and my entire energy system completely collapsed so I had a complete breakdown and uh, couldn't eat couldn't sleep um, had a headache was nauseous all the time every thought about sex was disgusting and um, I wanted to kill myself so uh, ended up on a balcony um, wanted to jump and had um, very little to do with this life anymore so I was, I was on the way out literally and um, I haven't jumped as you see I'm sitting here so I just collapsed on this side of the balcony gratefully and I had an insight that was my awakening and that insight was just like a voice from the inside saying just like check out what is love and tantra and I said okay <laughs> let's do it so next day and that was before internet, so not computer or iPhone or anything. Um, I just uh, went to a, a bookshop in the city Hannover where I lived. And uh, there were just exact, it was the, one of the biggest bookshops there. And Hannover is kind of a middle sized city in, in Germany. So um, pretty decent bookshop. And they had two books on Tantra. And one of them I just like took out and op op opened that and just start reading and said, just like, Yes, that's yes, 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 yes. And something was resonating so deep inside of me that I was just sold. I said, okay, whatever that is, I want to figure that out. And the first thing that was resonating with me that the author of that book, I can't even tell the name anymore, but was saying that instead of following the goal, it's just like we enjoying the ride. And instead of um, finding gratification and satisfaction through the goal, we learn how to enjoy the present moment without doing anything with it. So this is not about getting anything out of it. It's just like being here and being present. And there was this part in me that was start resonating. And um, this is how I would like to start. So as you see that um, I have this book here, there are tons of information about my life and about the orgasmic blueprint and what that all is. And two hours would be too little, but I would like to give you like a, a focused understanding of what the orgasmic blueprint is. So we have all an orgasmic um, capacity that is vibrating on a cellular structure in our body and nervous system resonance that we all orgasmic beings and that most of us including me um, have been conditioned in into a sexuality that is procreation driven so it's just like as if we're living a life like a uh, reproducing animal trying to making more of us to make sure that our species will survive 
And um, that might sound pretty harsh and um, judgmental. And even though I try not to be judgmental, I am because I was totally conditioned in this dynamic. You know? Sexuality was based on my own understanding that it starts with a turn on and it ends with a climax and that's it. And that was all I had. And I would have never given that up if somebody else wouldn't, uh, if somebody else would have told me different. So I just had to go the painful way that I actually thought um, um, is needed to go. So I had the idea before I had this awakening that I, I am a multi-orgasmic man. And I did not know what that meant, really. I was assuming that means I can have as many climaxes as I want. And this is what I probably was proving myself in the age of 27. And um, I just paid a high price. And luckily, I did that paid that high price. Otherwise, I wouldn't sit here today and would uh, sitting here next to that book and would talk um, to you about this orgasmic blueprint and that work that I'm providing to the world. So I would like to show you some maps there in the book, um, at least two of them. And then I would like to do some exercises with you and give you a um, broader understanding what the blueprint is and how to find it and how you can use it and how you um, um, make it yours as much as you like by saying that. I have not gotten any truth that is universal. I found my truth. And I love to share my truth. And if that is resonating with you, then make it yours and pick out of that what you like. So please question everything what I'm saying. Um, sometimes I generalize a little bit. And um, important is that you filter out of that what is resonating with you and make it yours as much as you like. Yeah. So that you have... Um, the highest benefit out of that that you like. So um, let's start it. I like that. So um, I start sharing my screen and then we go a little bit deeper during the session. All right. So Everybody can see that sexual arousal being horny. Thumbs up. Yeah, I see one thumb that uh, includes probably all other thumbs. I need to put that down here. Okay, so um, let's say that's a graph and that graph is um, demonstrating your capacity of being horny and being aroused. And before I start, I would like to see some activation of you in the in the chat, um, write a one if you are like being turned on and horny and write a two if you think being aroused and horny is so f f freaking boring. I don't want to have anything to do with that. So are you a one or are you a two? Ones, ones, one, 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 one. I saw one, two at the beginning. That's fine too. Um, one, 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 one. One, one, one. All right. Okay, so now here comes the second question. Do you like climaxing? Do you like a peak climax? Do you like peak climax? If you are, a, a yes, I like climaxing. Write one. If you think like now climaxing is for losers or whatever, then write a two. One, one, one. One, there's a two coming. Ones, 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 ones. Two, a one. Yes. All right. Okay. So getting a little bit of a sense here. Yeah. So. Before I start this thing here, I just want to differentiate between four different ways of sexuality that you can use your sexuality for. The first one is procreation. Yeah. We all come from procreation. It's important. Our parents did that. Thank you, mom. Thank you, dad. Without them, we wouldn't be here. Except you are, have been produced in a laboratory. Then somehow your parents gave 
their eggs and their sperm and to some degree um, that created that body yes so procreation is good um, procreation is based on how we maintain our species making more of us it's important without that we wouldn't be here and humanity would not be there where we are if that's good or bad i don't know you can make up your own mind about that but this is a fact procreation is important and we all have that it's a cellular survival mechanism it's a structure in our body that we all have it doesn't matter which um, gender identification you carry and it belongs to us is good. Um, um, question here for you is, when you having sex, do you wanna procreate every time you're having a climax? Write a one for yes, write a two for no. Oh, I see a lot of twos coming. Whoa, 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 no, 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 true, 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 true. Do you want to procreate and making babies every time you have a climax? Two, 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 two. I was, nobody has a one. Nobody wants to create his own nation. Two, a big two. Two, 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 two. two, two. Two, two, two. So that's a rhetoric question. Why the heck do you have sex every time as if you procreate then? Because I saw a lot of ones, so that when you have sex, that you want to want to you like orgasm, you like climaxing. What is literally a procreative? Um, imperative in your body so why don't you climax every time when you orgasm when you don't want to procreate every time why don't you have procreative sexual um, um, endings it's a rhetoric question do you have to answer that yourself i have an answer to that myself <laughs> because <laughs> it's an addiction it's an addiction-like dynamic in the reward system that is the mother of all addictions, substituting procreation if we just not procreating and following coffee in, tea in, smoking, drugs, alcohol, and all that stuff. It's a substitution of that main addiction of procreation. And that's where I want to guide you through. And sorry, it sounds pretty... Um, harsh um, but it's actually a really um, interesting dynamic in our body yeah. that, that does not mean it's wrong or bad I just want to give you some options some different ideas about that what else is possible to guide you into the idea what this tantric thing is for and is about so let's get it started so we like to be aroused, we like to be horny, and, um, and as long as we possibly can. You know? I like that. I like to get turned on for as long as I possibly can. And um, I guess that's true for you too. So another question, I want to put that in here. If you like to get it over as soon as possible, write a one. If you think you want to you want to maintain and expand the time as long as you possibly can, write a two. I thought so. Yeah, I thought so. I'm definitely a big two. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm 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 a two. <laughs> so we have one point fives, and we have had a one. Depends on the mood, but mostly two. Uh huh. And um, yeah, so let's let's stop here. I've, I've, otherwise, I have more questions, but we'll just go there later. So um, what we all know in sexual encounter is to some degree, some foreplay. 
and everybody, as far as I know, loves foreplay, is not always the case. Sometimes we just go straight to the point and we just want to have fast, that's all good. But foreplay is normally starting with some sensual or with some mental ideas or with some kind of engagement that is not sexual. It, it just it might start with kissing and might start with hugging or with massaging or in any other way. So foreplay. Foreplay is good. I love foreplay. Then the question is if foreplay is just the foreplay for the real stuff, what is happening, then foreplay is not the real stuff, then the real stuff is the sexual encounter. And if the sexual encounter starts normally with a climax, then the real thing is actually the climax. And I think that this is a kind of a false belief that most people have that I highly question and that I would like to question with this presentation. So the point of no return, everybody knows that, is when you reach that point, you're coming to this internal neurological expansion or contraction, there is no way back. When you reach the point of no return, you will come if you want that or not. If you reach the point of no return in a sexual encounter and even your grandmother is coming into the room, you will climax. There's no way back. So the point of no return will kick you over the edge into a climax. And that's for every sexual identification the same. It doesn't matter if you identify as a man or a woman, if you have a penis or a vagina or anything in between. Yeah? Point of no return is that part when you on the climax, then you are over the edge and that's it. I'm not talking about an orgasmic state. I'm talking about the contractive peak climax. So when you start the foreplay, when you start making it up with your partner, when you start feeling cozy and cuddly, kissy, touchy, massagey, with, connected with another, you release oxytocin in your, in your system. It's a neurotransmitter and hormone that makes you feel good and connected, makes you feel safe makes you feel cozy, it's a cuddle drug, it's everything that allows you to feel connected with your partner and makes you feel soft and expanded in yourself. And then on one point, when you start to get turned on, you release dopamine in your system. Dopamine is that where you want to have more of, like when you drink alcohol, you want to have another glass. When you smoke, you want to have an, you, you not smoke one cigarette, you're, just, you're, you're a smoker or you're not a smoker. Same with coffee in, is, you know, the dopamine is that when you start to get turned on, when you know you're just getting towards the climax, dopamine is getting you driven into that place. So climaxing um, um, is this place of where you have an, a certain amount of dopamine in your system and when you uh, reach that certain amount of dopamine in your system and you reach the point of no return, you climax. Everybody knows that. I know that uh, in every detail. I had a lot of experience in that. And climax is what drives dopamine-driven sexuality. So above this point of no return, there is no way back into this um, sensual space of connection. So when you reach the point of no return, you have a change of neurotransmitter and hormones in your body that is undeniable. And I would like to ask you with a one or with a no, when you reach the point of no return and when you had a climax, are you more horny or you're less horny? Please write a one, you're more horny, or write it two, now you're less horny. One is more horny, two is less horny after a climax. One, one, two, one, usually two, one, one, two. It's a mix here. Different every time. So I think, and that's just my own observation is, that um, the difference if we are becoming orgasmic or if we having a climax, and I would define that as two different things. Right now I'm talking only about having an orgasm 
being orgasmic is a different thing, and and this is where I just want to go in a in a bit. But first, I just want to um, clean up here with procreative sex. So most men, and as far as I know, women as well. And um, please forgive me if I'm um, um, in terms of men and women here, but mostly men know porn. Yeah. And when you know one pawn, you know every pawn because every pawn ends with the same final, and that's the man is ejaculating. Yeah. And pawn has done a great job in our awareness. It has trained us to finish the sexual encounter in an average of 7.5 minutes. In my best times, I could just go in three or less. Yeah. So this is the average on time from no time to climax 7.5 minutes. So when I go back in the chat, just like, do you like short sex, getting over it as much as, as quick as possible, or you want to have long sex, the two, as long as you possibly can. Um, I remember there was a tons of twos. Yeah. So when the climax is just only taking 7.5 minutes, mm -hmm. Why would anybody choose that? Yeah, rhetoric question. You not, don't have to answer that. So here comes the neuro um, dynamic of our body when we climax. In the moment when we reach the point of no return, um, forgive me, we release serotonin in our body. Serotonin makes our nervous system and makes our body to feel euphoric. So we feel good. Yeah. And we all love to feel good. So when we climax, we release serotonin and it just comes in in a spike. And after it comes in, a few moments later, it drops down. In the moment when serotonin is dropping down, we are releasing prolactin. Prolactin is a hormone that women produce when they're breastfed and it makes your sexual energy goes down men and women producing that at the same time when they are climaxing, you know, when it's the contractive peak orgasm, the contractive climax. And that um, shows your body that the job is done to a degree. So when you release prolactin in your system, that normally makes you um, get less horny, that makes you less aroused. So when serotonin drops prolactin rises that tells your body it's time to turn around and taking a nap or doing something different so when prolactin drops serotonin goes on a roller coaster and as soon prolactin rises your dopamine level goes down so i haven't invented that there has been some scientific researches behind that that your dopamine your arousal level drops in the moment after climax and because you release prolactin in your system. The same is for oxytocin and it creates a hangover, a post-orgasmic hangover that can last between seven hours and up to seven days or 21 days even. So here comes the thing that the procreative sex that is based on this idea has one reason that when people procreate without creating offspring, that this imprint on the nervous system tells us one specific thing. If this person is not the um, mother or father of my offspring, go and find another one. All right. If there are any questions on that, um, please feel free to type it in the chat and I will read as much as I can to answer that. There's another part to that. This is not the end. This is just the beginning. It's, it's getting much better. So this is the worst part of the presentation. If you have any question, please feel free. Because I will go to the bathroom. I need 
two minutes of pee break. If you need anything, do the same. Please write the question in. I will be back in two minutes. Um, that's exactly how I feel when a man is not so into a woman anymore after they had sex. Yes, this is exactly how I felt um, not being after the woman anymore when I had sex with her before uh, that I was totally adoring her as my queen and desired angel. And afterwards, I could not take care less of her. That's exactly true. So take that as this one. So to come back to the four different layers of sex, procreation. So this is procreative sex. Yeah? As I said, there's nothing wrong or bad about that. It's just the fact this is how it is. And we all have been living that to a degree, to some um, a degree, and we all come from that. So it is actually good. So thank you, mom. Thank you, dad. We are here. We did a good thing. Nobody has really taught and shown us anything different. Um, there's the question. And how can we change that? This is the rest of that presentation. I just wanted to just like drop this little kind of uh, bomb here. So when we don't want to procreate every time we have a climax, when we don't want to procreate every time we have sex, why not taking this quantum leap and putting procreative sex in a sacred corner? Because it is sacred. We are all sacred. We are all born from sacred encounter, more or less. But if we want to just like choose to produce consciously, then procreation is sacred. That's just my take on, on that. So let's just as an idea, and you don't have to take that as your ideology, just like put it somewhere in a sacred corner, just up there. Just for these two hours that we have here, or one and a half left. And let's see that there are other levels to that. So after procreation comes recreation. So everything that is fun, playful, joy, you know, being, being in a good state with another, just... Um, play is the best expression of that the next one is rejuvenation if sexual energy feels good then it must be healthy for our body so the ideology of tantra and yoga in thousand years of practices around that they've proven that this is extremely rejuvenating i mean just look at me i'm 81 no i'm 53 i said that already but you know it just keeps you young and healthy Something happens to your body, your system is vibrating in a different frequency. And why not using sexual energy as a rejuvenating aspect of keeping your body healthy and fresh? Because I like to be horny and I like to be turned on and just feels good to my body. So I see Maggie doing a good stretch here. I like that. And I would like to invite each and one of you from a rejuvenating part, whenever you feel like stretch your arms, move your body in any form, get up, do a stretch, and just stay in a self-responsible way connected to your body and feel vital. Yeah, I do that anyway all the time. So we have rejuvenating. And then the next part is where Tantra and yoga and the, the kind of all the traditions heading into is transformation. So procreation, recreation, rejuvenation, and transformation. And you get to choose which one resonates most with you. Yeah? Nobody will tell you one is better than the other or one is right or one is wrong. Each and one of you has a certain approach in their life, how you want to live your sexuality. I found mine. If you find yours to some degree, hallelujah. If you just don't want to find it and you just want to do whatever you want to do, go for it. That's totally fine. There's nothing right or wrong. So you need to choose on one point how you want to live your sexuality. I found mine and I love it. So now we're going to the next slide. And here it's becoming interesting to me. So 
I call that being on the edge and becoming orgasmic. So that's part of the orgasmic blueprint is how to become orgasmic and how to live that in our body that we can use this vehicle as, um, as a biochemical factory that is producing everything that we need to live the life that we want to live. Yeah. We don't need any substances. We don't need any drugs. We are a drug factory. And it's just the question how to access that. So let's start again. So you have the point of no return here and you want to have a level of oxytocin in your body that is stative. You want to access oxytocin in your body that keeps your nervous system in a constant expanded, in a constant safe, in a constant connected. So the, the next part of this presentation will show you how to find that first i want to give you this kind of thoughtware upgrade that you have another context around it so oxytocin is the main dynamic in your nervous system to have um, um, to unleash your orgasmic capacity your potential so then um, and I call that direct pleasure and the sensory inflow, but we go there in a second. This is what I call relaxed arousal. So then, of course, when you're relaxed arousal and when you start to get cozy and cuddly and nice and get turned on, um, your dopamine is not taking over. Your level of turn on, your, your, hun your hunger for climax in your a goal-oriented search for the gratification is not taking over your connective level of oxytocin. You stay in the level of oxytocin and you stay in the level of connection. And to some degree, you start feel euphoric. You release serotonin in your body. You start feeling connected and you start feeling love and ecstatic. You know? And then you release endorphins from your different glands. In, in your body where you just get into um, an, an orgasmic vibration into an orgasmic sensation in your system and then you start breathing deeper you release melatonin it's this kind of ha ah, fill up your lungs being in connection with your breath moving your body being attuned and you just use your sexual dynamics for whatever you want to use it for you can play the three minute game is part of the book. Um, that's just all stuff. You can be in BDSM and play with dynamics of power and surrender and submission and whatever rocks your boat. You just go for pleasure and being in vanilla sex. You just use it for the tantric or for the yoga tradition of rejuvenating to keep your body young. You're just like you're a pervert and you like, love any kind of king or you just go for the fun of it or you just use it with the um, dynamic of Tantra. It doesn't really matter what it is. What matter is that when you, now I have to move my thing here because I can't see. When you stay in connection for about 15 to 30 minutes in this cocktail, you release DMT in your pineal gland. It's getting released not only from your pineal gland, it's getting released in something where your brain is swimming in, in the cerebrospinal fluid. Yeah. It's 20, uh, 250 milliliters, something like that. It goes down your spine. And there's a fiber in there. And this fiber is um, responsible for creating stem cells. So when you start, you flood your cerebrospinal fluid with DMT when you are in sexual arousal, so in this edge becoming orgasmic, you, your cellular structure starts to vibrate on another frequency. And I would like to ask you, do you have an experience in your life where you had this release where you can see, feel, and sense on another frequency where you beyond 
the um, goal-driven sex and feel there's something different in your perception. Please write a one in the chat. And if you think, Matt, what you write is completely bullshit, there is no thing like that, write a two. One, 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 one so much, one, one, I think so. One, 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 great. So I love that, that we're all on the same page. It sounds like we're speaking all the same language. So um, let's get a little bit deeper into that. So when you release DMT in your cerebrospinal fluid and your body starts to get activated and you vibrate in a different frequency, I love to vibrate in this different frequency and it just feels good in my body. And this fiber that is creating stem cells is just making sure that my cellular structure is always in a rejuvenating and unhealthy dynamic. Yeah. So this cerebrospinal fluid is changing over four times a day. Yeah. Even if you release DMT in your cerebrospinal fluid after 13 to uh, 15 to 30 minutes, after about six hours, the entire thing is gone because it changes and washes back into your body. So you can't stay there forever because the nervous system is not wired that way. Yeah. Of course, we have to do different things. We have to eat, we have to drink, we have to sleep, we have to shit, we have to work, we have to do different things in life. Yeah. So the nervous system is not wired that way to stay in an ecstatic place all the time. So, and there's no danger to it. It's just healthy. It's just good for the body. So when you start playing with that consciously, sex and connection can become a spiritual experience because the level of transformation is just a bonus and a byproduct. It just happens. You don't need to hunt for it. You're just creating something in your system that is your nature. It's your organic right that belongs to you that you can access at any given moment whenever you want that it belongs to you nobody can give that to you nobody can take it away from you it it's your orgasmic blueprint it's there everybody has that independent from sexual orientation from gender identification from anything everybody can have that doesn't matter if you're heterosexual or multisexual or if you are in a in a um, homosexual or whatever relationship you're in, every human being has access to that. It belongs to you. So, because there are three main points in life where we release DMT, one of them is when we're born, one of them is when we die, where we're accessing the portal into another dim dimension, and another one is when we're doing this kind of weird sexual thing in tantra edging or however you want to call it so you have access to that it belongs to you this is want to say that again so then you're creating on this level of consciousness this unity experience with the feeling of being one with life because you will go beyond your personality structure of me myself and i where you can't identify anymore if this body that you're touching is yours or the other person, where you're dropping into that place of oneness in unified consciousness, not only in your, I don't know, spiritual awareness as well with your body. And it feels extremely good. So this is the level of transformation that I call it's your bliss state. So the bliss state is that what this entire book is about? So your orgasmic blueprint. So now the question again, write a one if you enjoy being in the bliss state and write a two if you think that totally sucks. One, 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 big one. <laughs> one, 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 one. I love the ones.
Okay, so I think we are all on the same on the same level. Are there any questions about anything that I've been writing so far? So I stopped the sharing here. That's how far I want to go. Is there any question, anything that anybody has? 1.5, I can uh, dissociate in a big way. And I'm curious about your perspective on the sense of duality being held in an orgasmic bliss state. Um, that's, I don't know if I can read the question out of that yet. I see the word dissociation and I see the word duality. And the way how I, um, can I use words via microphone? Um, no, I think that would kind of rip a, um, a, a hole in the presentation. I just say a few words about that. So dissociation is, is a neurological state that keeps us away from being present. So we all dissociate to a degree during the day and every time. Um, but dissociation, when it comes to a sexual encounter, is in my perspective um, a connection with fear of losing control. So the question is there, how can you dive into a deeper place of yourself in your fear that losing control is not a threat that you have to dissociate? That would be the counter question to that. I just leave it there. You might can use that counter question and just um, investigate somehow somewhere. Any other question? All right, so okay, here comes something in. If you would like emotional support, also so this is the tech engine, so okay. If you like any emotional support, please reach out to so she's here. She's she's as well a psychologist when I hear that right. So she, you are really in good hands. She probably knows what I'm talking about even better than I do. So please feel free to reach out to her. And Maggie is as well a very advanced practitioner. So they are not only tech angels, they're as well practitioner of the art. So please, you can reach out to them and talk to them um, behind the scene. Uh, what role does breath play? Thank you for that question. It's melatonin. Melatonin is a vital factor of the DMT molecule that is getting produced in your pineal gland and without breath it's hard to release DMT. So you need your breath. You can have the release of DMT through breath alone, but I promise it feels much better when sexual energy is involved than just breathing. Breathing is nice. Um, breathing is very liberating. It's a great um, uh, uh, mechanism in the body, but melatonin um, is created through breath. And therefore the three pillars of Tantra, sound, breath, and movement, you need your breath to create DMT, so or melatonin to create DMT. That's the um, main answer here. Okay. So as we are all on the same plate, and uh, as far as I have figured that out with the ones and with the twos, speaking the kind of the same language, the question is, how do we get there? Easy, efficient, um, where is the connection between blueprint and orgasmic through these graphs? Where is the connection between blueprint and orgasmic, orgasm through these graphs? I'm, I'm not sure if I'm getting that question. My, my, my brain doesn't understand that. So the, the blueprint of the way how I would say that is, um, we have all an individual pathway blueprint, right? And if you just like to get into your orgasmic blueprint, if you like to follow your individual capacity to go there, you can either choose to have a climax and throw your capacity of your blueprint into a tissue or you know, in the sleeping pill when you go to sleep, I don't know which one you are, or, <laughs> oh, um, or you choose to um, um, use the edging part and be as orgasmic as you like, as long as you want, whenever you choose. Next question, what role does sound play? 
So, sound. Who of you have heard about the vagus nerve? Some of you, so you're experts, I like that. So the vagus nerve is this ventral part of our parasympathetic nervous system that has um, a lot to do with our social engagement system. You know, social engagement system is how do we relate with people in proximity? So when we are close, eye contact, face contact, and being safe with another. So the, the vagus nerve is has a specific function that causes neuroception that is detecting your environment if you're safe with a person or not. So if your vocal cords are suppressed, then your vagus nerve, your capacity of your social engagement system is not open and expressed because if you're getting orgasmic, if you're getting in this place of expressing your joy, your pleasure, your, whatever's going on in your body, you will need your sound, I promise. If you try to suppress your sound, there's no way you can be any close to orgasmic. It's a natural expression of just like being into, oh my God. God, it's so delicious. <laughs> and if you're trying to suppress it, oh my God, this is so delicious. <laughs> There's not much aliveness to your capacity of your vagus nerve expression of who you are as a, as a being. Um, so your vocal cords, um, your larynx are connected to your capacity of an open um, vagus nerve complex of your social engagement system. It needs to be open. Otherwise, you know, the, the, the parasympathetic activity, if you're safe and if you're open, is the so-called ventral part of your parasympathetic. But your orgasmic state, the state of being in this expansion and in your um, um, orgasmic capacity, it's the so-called dorsal part of your parasympathetic. And the dorsal part of your parasympathetic is either in the not safe side, you're shut down, you're numb and you can't feel anything. Or it's on the safe side when you are totally connected, your capacity of your bliss state. Yeah. And you're only opening up into this capacity of your bliss state if your ventral vagus nerve is completely included and you're expanded and in relaxation. Otherwise, there's no bliss state and that includes sound, breath and movement. Okay. Good, but there's a much easier way. That's what I want to show you. All right. Okay, so um, here's another question. How do you prevent or handle stuck energy blue balls for male bodies from edging? Okay, I go into that question because it was a big question for me for many years. And as much as I know, for male practitioner of Tantra, when um, they come to that place of um, wanting to learn this Tantric idea, and in the past I was start talking about that, and just like, if that would be so easy, everybody could, could do it. So what is happening if you have trained your body for 10, 15, 20 years, it depends on your age, to climax fast, to climax quick, your lymph system is not activated in your genital area. So your lymph system is that part that is absorbing fluid and energies from your sexual organs back into the body. So when you have trained your lymph system to be dormant and not functional because you have trained your body to go as fast as possible in, I don't know, between five and 10 minutes into the climax, your body has never learned to reabsorb fluid back into the body. So it doesn't matter how long you just go there when your, 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 your testicles will produce semen all the time. And if you are used to get it out, then there's nothing to reabsorb. But if your lymph system is not activated, this energy is getting stuck. So the fluid is getting stuck in the body. And that is, um, there's a, actually a term for that that I have not uh, at the moment, the so-called blue ball syndrome. So what that needs is some activation of the lymph system 
that this can start to reabsorb the fluid back into the body. And that is a, is a practice that can take for some men up to three months because most men having this tendency to clench and contract their PC muscle. So that means as well that the entire muscular tissue in the genital area is tight. And to loosen that up, it takes for some men some time to relax this tissue in the pelvic area and, you know, in this, in, in, in the entire um, uh, lower body. And what happens for most men when they start doing that and loosening up, and I was one of them, I was one of these tight asses because I was starting with the Mantak Chia practice of the so-called kegeling, you know, you just like squeeze it hard and you squeeze it better and you just get an erection by squeezing, you maintain your erection by squeezing, and then you intensify your ejaculation by squeezing your PC muscle. Yeah. Um, I just w- would like to know type of one if you are one of them. <laughs> I was one of them. I've done that for only 25 years of my life. One, and the same for male and female, you know, the, the clenching, contracting, squeezing dynamic of your pelvic area, your muscles kind of tight, you need to be tight. I know there are more ones. I know there are more ones. You can't hide. I know there are more ones. Used to be still sometimes, yes. So we all do that to a degree. It's a sympathetic dynamic in the nervous system to control yeah so this control mechanism that keeps us away being orgasmic all the time so when we loosening that up as men and we we stop doing this tightening and we stop practicing that what we have trained our body in what most men go through between a three and a six month period is erectile dysfunction So man can't get him up anymore when that happens. And the only thing that men have is going back to their idea of how it was to clunge, maybe looking porn and just doing this entire thing about fantasizing and going away from their physical body into the fantasy world about what they have learned and trained their body in. All right. So about tightening up, but radically intensifying to produce climax absolutely the climax feels much better when you're tightening it up but does it make you orgasmic or does it make you climaxing and the the orgasmic blueprint is not about having more intense climaxes the orgasmic blueprint is about getting orgasmic having an ecstatic orgasmic life and using your body as an ecstatic orgasmic capacity to live a different approach of your sexuality. All right, so let's make it really, really simple and easy. So, because this is the fun part, the rest was just like. So, what you will find in the book as well are our adaptive survival mechanisms to belong and fit in to be liked and um, pleasing other people specifically our partner or doing something to our partner to make them feel good that we can feel good and better about ourselves so we have all learned that the action that we provide the action that we're doing in our life as a survival structure, unconsciously, somewhere long back before we could speak our name, we have learned that our action is to make it right for others. So we have learned that we do something to get something back, to get a result. So we're using our impulses of action towards to get something done. We are productive, we are Um, being liked and we um, trying to fit in and and be loved yeah so we all do that to a degree 
but what would be if we can use our skin and our action as a resource to creating this dynamic of relaxed arousal and releasing oxytocin in our nervous system that we can stay in an expanded connection to ourself and the person we are with. What if we can restructure our neurological pathways that we are inherently capable of using our skin for our own benefit in the first place and that's what i would like you to what, what i i would like to show you so um my invitation to you is take something in your hand that is around you that feels kind of interesting to you it can be anything i don't have anything here right now i go and get one please go and get something get up do a stretch do something move your body a little bit and get something that feels good to take in your hands So if you have found something, please put it just like in the camera, if your camera is on. So whatever it is, it's just something. It doesn't really matter what it is. You know, just like I have just a piece of wood here that I found on Grand Canyon in America, maybe 20 years ago or so. So you have done something revolutionary right now. You have been in an action for yourself. You just went into your motor impulses um, uh, expression and picked something up for yourself. You have not done that for me or not for anybody else in your family. You were a selfish little bastard doing something just for yourself. That's where we want to go. So you have that in your hand. And my invitation is you just lean back. So I have a sofa here. I lean back here. Lean back on a chair, make sure that you're really comfortable, um, that your body, your shoulders, your spine is relaxed. There's no work to do here. You don't have to provide anything for anybody. You don't have to be productive. You just relax for a moment. Relax the shoulder, relax your arm. If you feel like taking a cushion in your lap and just make connection with your hands with that object. What's the temperature? Is it soft or is it smooth? And my invitation is none of you has to do that. It's an invitation. But when you only hear and listen what I'm saying or watching other people doing it, you will not getting it on a somatic level. So you need to feel it in your body. Otherwise, it won't work. So you choose. So when you have that in your hand, you need to feel that with your skin. And you slow down your speed by half. It doesn't matter how fast you go and you slow it down by half again. And that might be you have just some micro movements here. You might need to stop totally, it doesn't really matter. And then you just follow some micro impulses that you move your hands on it because it feels pleasant. It's nothing you have to figure out on that thing. Nothing you have to prove here. And the invitation is to play on different parts of your hands. You can hold it with one hand and move the other hand, or you hold it still and move that hand. 
and experiment for a while. Where does it feel really good? Maybe between your fingers. Maybe on your palm. Maybe up there on your fingertips. And go really slowly and gentle. Maybe on your nail bed. Maybe on the backside or on your wrists. So we're looking for this kind of pleasant, a little bit electromagnetic, tinglish sensation. With kind of some thoughts or some feelings coming up to that, just welcome it and bring your attention straight back to your hands. So you choose how much you want to dive into that. So this is not about giving anything to anybody. This is not about love or relationship. It's not about any belief system or tantra. It's just, can your skin feel it or not while you're moving? Super simple. Doesn't mean anything, doesn't go anywhere. And you choose your action here. Nobody tells you what to do or how to do it. You moving towards the felt sense of pleasure in your hands. like a deliciousness. The invitation is again to drink in as much of that as you choose. Not because you have to, not because I want you to, because you can and you want that for yourself. So while you are in connection with this object in your hands, I invite you for a few more minutes to take as much, or include as much on, of your body as you like. So feel your hands first and then you might want to choose to touch other different body parts that feel pleasant too. So that your action is still towards a felt sense of pleasure in your body.
And you might have some different feelings coming up now. They're all welcome too. And bring it straight back to the sensation of your skin. Because you choose. And how much can you stay in connection with your own sensations? So we have more nerve ending in our hands per square millimeter in our skin than anywhere else in our body, except our mouth and our genitals. And when your hands will get it, the rest of your body will get it. Because it opens up your pathway into your pleasure center that is oxytocin based. It's not the dopamine driven reward center. It's this part that is connected to feelings. And why you are so at ease and relaxed, I invite you for a few more moments to move as much with any part of your body on any part in the room as you like to feel as much of your skin as you choose. You might want to lay down and move your entire body, or you just want to rub yourself on the wall, or you just rub your butt on the, on the seat, or whatever feels good. So just allow your body to move slowly and gentle as much as you like. Oh. <sighs> And allow your sound and your breath to go. It's not about going anywhere. It's just to enjoy the fact that you can feel yourself. And go as slowly and gentle as you possibly can. Experiment with your eyes open or with your eyes closed, what feels more right for you. It's not about sexuality, it's not about climaxing. It's just creating a foundation of oxytocin in your system. You might notice feeling kind of soft and relaxed. You might even start feeling a sense of arousal, you might not, not meet here. And just welcome yourself in that. might drop out of your mind completely.
Mm, okay. Ah, and then slowly and gently bring your awareness back to the screen. And whatever you have in your hands, keep on playing with it. So stay in connection with this sensory dynamics. So this is a very simple, basic somatic exercise. And each one of you has done some profound biohacking right now. Because you were in an action, so your motor impulses of moving was towards a felt sense of pleasure on your skin. And when you slow down enough, you're literally creating a short circuit somewhere in your feeling center that makes you extremely relaxed. And I'm wondering after doing that for about five to 10 minutes, how do you feel now in your system, in your body? And write one or two words in the chat if you still can write. Present, calm, slow. Juicy, calm, relaxed, increased bodily sensations. Tinglish. Soft, sensitive and calm. Calm me, peaceful and fully in my body, soft bliss. Heightened presence. Grounding. Open. If you like to feel what you feel right now, just please type a one. If you think, oh my God, that's too challenging, write a two. Yes, I was assuming that there will be a lot of ones. So what we just did with this object, with the hands and feeling ourselves, we created the foundation of oxytocin in our nervous system. So what you do is some super hardcore biohacking. You know, when you do that for about three minutes and we did probably 10, I was just really nasty with you. When you do that for three minutes, you you release central oxytocin in your brain. And that's inhibiting the release of cortisol and adrenaline from your fight flight center, from your amygdala. So your amygdala is firing four times a second, checking your environment if you're safe. But when you do that one here, when you feel oxytocin, you're creating this relaxed arousal foundation that you just all wrote, you know, open grounding. So you choose by doing that, the foundation of relaxed arousal that I showed you in the graph of the orgasmic edge. So the how to do that, this is how you do it. You stay with your attention, with your awareness in connection with your skin and you move towards a felt sense of pleasure. Yeah, that's the foundation. But now here comes the question to you. And, and I would like to go in a breakout room with that. 
of course, we have all this tendency. We can all feel ourselves because it's so easy with an object. You know, it's just so good. We know exactly how to do that. We know exactly how to feel ourselves on something. But what happens when we're touching another person we just really want to be close with? When we're feeling ourselves, what keeps you away from feeling yourself in a continuum when you're touching another person? What is blocking you? What is your obstacle? to continue feeling yourself when you touch another person. So we go into a breakout room and you have two minutes each. And we have a, break, uh, um, um, a random breakout room. You come with a person that you don't know. If you don't want to go to the breakout room, you just simply don't click breakout room. If you don't want to be with the person you are ending up in a breakout room, you say thank you and goodbye and come back. If you feel like that this person is not resonating with you in the middle of it, you can say at any time, okay, I don't want to do that. I move away. Thank you. Yeah, there's no obligation here. So the question again is, what is blocking you? What's your obstacle to stay in a continuum connection within yourself when you're touching a person you want to be in proximity with? The person who is talking is talking about themselves and their experience for two minutes. What is keeping you away from feeling yourself? The other person is just listening. There's nothing to say, there's nothing to respond or to repair is just being present with the other person's sharing. I send after two minutes a note, broadcast, and then you change over and the other person is sharing. If the other person doesn't want to share or the other person doesn't want to listen, you can say stop at any time and come back. Okay. So, um, Maggie, could you please set up, we are 26 minus, I think, four, this 22. Can you have about 11 breakout rooms for two people, please? Yes, thank you. All right. All right. Um, I guess there are a few more people coming back. As soon the breakout room is closing, that's exactly now. And hi, everyone. Welcome back. We have changed the dynamics because there was something going wrong and that was not really working out well. So apologize if we were in an amazing exercise with somebody and we just like interrupted and just fished you back. What I would like to do at this point is, um, Maggie, please uh, stop the recording for about two minutes. And um, we just going in the price. If you just want to write more about that, what is blocking you, your obstacle, you can please write it in the chat. That's totally fine and welcome. Uh, partner always going straight for the genitals leads to numbness, then frustration. I know that one very well. Thank you. That was a good one. So what I hear you saying, and that's my experience about myself and being with others, is when we can feel ourselves, you know, with an object is easy peasy. You know, everybody can feel that. But when we are with another person and when we're feeling ourselves, please write a one in the chat if you're losing yourself into the other person's experience and write a two. If you say, no, I can stay in a continuum, totally fine, connected to myself all the time. One, 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 one. We're losing ourselves in the other person. 1.5, yes. That's a two, yes. No, a two, yes. One, one, one. So here comes the secret. And with that secret, I just want to bring it to a closer because I promise there's so much more to learn to that. You have no idea. So what most people do, and I guess most of you 
uh, one of them without knowing it is that we are trained or conditioned in ourselves, in our nervous system, that our action is only valuable when we get a benefit from the other person back. This is our number one, and this is how we are wired most of the time based on conditionings. So what I'm describing in that book, in the orgasmic blueprint, and that's all your orgasmic blueprint too, and it took me a while to figure that out in my own nervous system is, we have to make our capacity to feel when we are with another person, our default, our number one. So when we are touching another person, instead of losing ourselves in the other person, we have to learn to making ourself priority with what we feel. And here is the proof of the pudding. If somebody else is touching you and they want to have a response out of your body, which touch do you prefer more? Somebody can feel themselves or somebody is losing themselves into you and want you to get turned on. Which one do you like more? One is they enjoy themselves. Two is they want to get you turned on and want to feed of you. One, one, one. I promise there is actually only one. Because of this is the best touch we can have. One, 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 one. So here comes the secret. When we're touching our partner and we are in connection with ourselves, this is what I call the direct root of pleasure. Yeah, it's, it's a neurological somatic biohacking that you are in action toward a felt sense of joy in your skin. That's your default because it's our all default from the first breath that we take after we got born. That's the foundation of, of the development of our social engagement system, our ventral vagus nerve, how we engage with the world based on safety. If you're making that your default, you are in the, on the best way to activate your orgasmic blueprint. I promise that. So here comes the trick. If this is your default and you, are, can, you can stay constantly in connection with your own experience, with your own touch, then the response of the other person coming back is an extra or a bonus and a secondary. Because you need that to read the other person's cues that you feel connected to yourself, but that has to be primal, that has to be your default. When you start losing yourself in the other person, what their response is, you're losing the connection to your own sensations and it's like as if the relaxed arousal, your oxytocin delivery in your neuro factory is stopping the delivery. And that's normally the end of central engagement. And this is where people start to get, um, where they start going for the goal, where they start going for the gratification, where they start going for the procreative, vibration of survive in our nervous system so it's a transformative journey that you can choose to go on every time you engage with another person physically unfortunately this online dynamic is not designed that we can touch each other when i'm on a festival and, and as i told in the beginning i was just in brazil at the sexability festival i have played with these dynamics and now you can choose in the room, yeah, when you are with people. Who would like to have a sensual touch experience with whom in the room here? Who would like to go on a journey and touching another person? And then the entire structure of consent and communication comes into the play. 
how can we talk how can we agree and how can we negotiate and engage on a physical sensual level that we have the experience that we choose to have so this is all written in that book and can i ask you so to just like um post the link of about the book so i have done a gazillion researches on this book you know the the book in itself took me two years with three people to write that there are about 80 scientific researches in there it is for individuals for couples and for touch professional in any kind of touch profession profession that you do so there are all the dynamics um, that I found that I have laid out. I myself was a student of Betty Martin for six years. I've studied with her uh, um, the uh, uh, wheel of consent and consent dynamics. I have studied the nervous system with Stephen Porges, the polyvagal theory. And um, if you just want to know more as a touch professional or any kind of facilitator, how consent communication and agreement works out this is the book to go <laughs> I, I allow myself to say that um, not only that there's a community that we're having running and heather is one of this community hi heather so this is a community on um, mighty network where we're gathering people that we have an online course and in this online course you can study that stuff so the course calls Foundations of Somatic Consent. And you can learn how to practice that with yourself and with your partner that you have the a deeper experience of the orgasmic blueprint. And it comes with a weekly call of 90 minutes every Saturday where we talk about findings and where we talk about noticings and questions, everything that comes up for you that you want to practice with another person. And on top of that, there is a free app that calls Touch, Consent and Play, where you can play with other people the three-minute game. So the three-minute game is a fond foundational practice that has um, uh, got created by Harry Fettis to have with two people the dynamics of who is doing the action and who is that action for that allows you to feel it on the deepest core of your nervous system of, 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 of your of your body of your emotional expression and uh, it comes with a student handbook and the maps that you have seen in the beginning are all part of the book with i don't know 25 more of these maps um, it's all detailed laid out and um, if you would like to join the link is in the in the chat it's uh, somatic consent mn so it's mighty network and it comes of course with a subscription you can choose a monthly or yearly subscription and they are the coolest people you can imagine hanging out there and you can study with all together and you can bring everything that you have in life bring in there and do that in a community that is super supportive and super deep so that's an invitation the book in itself has a 50 percent off um, for the festival so you pay half of if of it if you want to have it when you downloaded it at this uh, link because it's an epub or a pdf and you can share it with as many people as you like friends family colleagues and you can use it for your own studies and invite other people to study with you so you can share it for free as part of it or if you just want to have the physical book like this ship you just go on that and you get it on um, Amazon. So it's just a self-published book. Um, on that point, I would like to opening up the um, Zoom room now. Um, I think you can stop the recording, Maggie, if there is any kind of question so that we can use the last 10 minutes for anything you would like to ask to know or any, not any noticings, anything that you found and would like to share with us. Any